Peace and richest blessings to all of you today. And welcome to my Wednesday IG Live, broadcasting from the very center of the magnificent universe. And why do I say that? I've always loved this particular quote by Dr. Thomas Troward, where he says, if you want to understand the nature of the limitless universe, you must do two things. You must realize you're at its center, and you must, you must let go of all thinking that, that you can contribute anything to its efficiency. So we're at the very center of the universe, we're at the center of the universal presence, and we can't in any way contribute to its efficiency, but we can make ourselves available to its omni-activity, which is love and peace and joy and harmony and bliss and ecstasy and intelligence. And so, indeed, I welcome you this afternoon, and we have with us Sadviji, beloved. How oh, are you? Oh, I am so wonderful. How are you? I'm outstanding. And before we get into a conversation, I just want these individuals to know who I have the privilege and the honor of being with, with this morning. She is a renowned uh, a spiritual leader, counselor, meditation teacher, motivational speaker located in Rishikesh, India. And she serves as a powerful, unique female voice of spiritual leadership throughout India and the world. She's the author of the newly released number one best-selling memoir, Hollywood to the Himalayas, a journey of healing and transformation. Sadvi, as we call her, is the Secretary General of the Global Interfaith Wash Alliance, an international interfaith organization dedicated to providing clean water, sanitation, and hygiene around the world so necessary. She's the president of Divine Shakti Foundation, a foundation that runs free schools, vocational training programs, and empowerment programs in India. She's busy. She's also the director of the world famous International Yoga Festival at Parmath Nikitan Ashram in Rishikesh, which I had the privilege of being there and being one of the pr presenters. It was a very powerful, powerful festival. It's been covered in the Time Magazine, CNN, the New York Times, and other prestigious publications. She's also the managing editor for the monumental project of the 11 volume encyclopedia of Hinduism. This is my friend, this is Satanji. She's here from India. We had to speak, particularly um, she, her latest contribution. I don't know how she found time to do this, but she did her, her memoir from Hollywood to the Himalayas. And we're gonna get into that. But before we do that, you know, listening obviously to your satsangs i've seen you in india and there's so much love and joy around you and there's also there's always an enthusiasm and a deep peace that resonates uh, from you and, and, and you, you know like, you like sparkle with joy you know tell us a little bit about your your transformation and you know what mm -hmm. you're growing up you know how you became this iteration of yourself what did you have to go through Wow. Well, first of all, Reverend Michael, just what a joy, what a blessing to be in your presence, to be together, to be with the communities in, in love. It's certainly so, so nice to be together physically in an actual embrace. And yet, this beautiful opportunity that we have to feel the energy together, to feel the love together, even through these mediums of technology, through these mediums of different waves of different types of energy in the world to feel that oneness. Yeah, the so, right use of technology. Yes, exactly. So thank you so much for this really wonderful opportunity. And the transformation you know, it feels to me not like my story. It feels mm. like the story of grace. My story implies that somehow I had done something. Whereas really it feels much more like something very powerful happened through me. And I was, I grew up in, America in California, 
raised in a very, very beautiful, very love-filled, privilege-filled, opportunity-filled, everything-filled environment and had, had so, so, so much. And in addition to the, the stresses and the strains and the normal challenges of being a, a young person growing up, especially in a city like LA and trying to figure out who you are and where you fit in and what, what it's all about. In addition to that, I also had experienced in my very early childhood some pretty severe trauma. Mm. And, and that it stayed with me and it really colored a lot of those early years of my life. I, I was kind of moving through the world with this, this identity around that trauma, around the abuse, around the abandonment. Mm. And, and that's not to say that I wasn't also able to really enjoy life and love life and be filled with love and excitement and joy. I was. And yet in moments of stress, in moments in terms of choosing relationships, in moments of how I, how I presented to myself in the world, so much of that was really colored by this identity of here's what you've been through, therefore here's how you are. I ended up with a very severe eating disorder. I was very severely bulimic and in and out of hospitals and treatment centers. And of course, that became another whole identity drama around that. And I had gotten to a point where I really had learned to kind of manage all of that, which was what I had thought was the highest goal that one could look for. Okay, you've been through trauma, you manage that, you manage the pain, you manage your food, you manage your addiction. I was married, so you manage the marriage, manage the relationship, manage my schoolwork. Nobody ever said to me, by the way, there's a whole other possibility. By the way, mm. you can actually be free of mm. this. It's not a matter of just learning to manage an addiction or manage your meals. You actually can be free of the whole identity, the whole drama that's wrapped up in what happened in those very few, very early years of life, but that tragically for so many people dictate the rest of their lives right. and prevent them from being able to really, really take in love and joy and grace. And then I ended up in India with a backpack. At 25, I had graduated from Stanford undergraduate. I was in the midst of getting a PhD in psychology and traveled to India because my husband wanted to go. I didn't even know anything about India. I had <laughs> no interest in India. I don't get any credit for having, you know, thought of India, planned India. I just, I went along. And one of the reasons, probably the primary reason that I even agreed to go was I was a very strict vegetarian, a very visceral vegetarian. I was a vegan and having traveled throughout Europe and South America and even other parts of the U.S., the number of fights that I had had with waiters in languages <laughs> I spoke and languages I didn't speak about what the broth of their vegetable soup is made of. Like, what kind of seasoning do they use? Do they have any of those, you know, <laughs> chicken bouillon powders or cubes or whatnot that they use? In, in Ecuador, we discovered that the place where we ate what we thought were vegetarian beans and rice and guacamole, well, the rice was actually being boiled in chicken broth. Yeah. And so I had all of this PTSD from trying to eat in other places. <laughs> and when, when he said India, I thought, well, at least in India, I can properly eat. So... Agreed to go, 
And that's really where on the airplane to India, the transformation began because Prior to that, I was not even in a place in my mind, in my heart, in my life that was aware of any transformation that was possible. Mm -hmm. Managing my life, micromanaging my life was sort of the best that I thought possible. And yet there I was flying somewhere over Southeast Asia. And suddenly I said to myself, this makes no sense. I live in the San Francisco Bay Area. There's fantastic Indian vegetarian food on our corner. Why am I traveling across the world to a country I know nothing about just to get the same food I can get on my corner? <laughs> and so I took a vow on that airplane. And the vow was that I would keep my heart open because I realized there must be a reason I'm going. And if I'm not aware of it, it means I need to keep my heart open so that the universe can make that available to me. Right. And the other part of the vow was if I don't keep my heart open, I'm going to get myself back to California. Like right. I'm not going to just let myself wander aimlessly through this country for three months with, right. an with a closed heart. So then over the next week to 10 days, that open heartedness, created situations that really became kind of the soil in which everything else happened, ranging from staying in a hotel, the only hotel that was on the side of the river where I now live, mm. on the side of the river where I had that transformation, the side of the river of Parmarth Nikathan, but also the only hotel that required us to carry our handbags and our, all of our luggage, not just our like carry on, but our whole, whole luggage across a 400 foot swinging footbridge. Hmm. Nobody, nobody said, hey, there's a boat. Nobody said, hey, there's a coolie. Nobody even said, hey, there's a back road. If you give me an extra few hundred rupees, I'll take it. But the driver let us off at the bridge and said, you cross bridge. And it would have been so easy to say, you know what, why don't you just take us to a different hotel? Just take us somewhere where you can drop us off at the front door of that hotel and we don't actually have to carry our luggage, you know, half a kilometer across a footbridge. But I didn't because I knew I'm being guided. This was the hotel I was guided to stay at. And that was what then led a few hours later to me walking down to the banks of Ganga and having this extraordinary experience of oneness, of opening, of mm. transformation, this experience of the presence of the divine that, yes. you know, I, I always thought that there was something wrong with me on a very deep level, something inherently wrong with me, wrong about me. And in that moment, that I experienced this infinite perfection, infinite presence of the divine, I realized I am not separate from that. Yes. And therefore, there is this infinite perfection yes. of me as well. There was nothing to be done, no place to go, just right there. Yes. Oh, my God. And that was all I could say for days was just, wow. oh my God, it is so beautiful. And I cried and cried and cried. And other than saying, oh my God, it's so beautiful. I was rendered pretty nonverbal. And I it's knew- It's timeless, it's dimensionless. Absolutely. And I knew this is where I need to be. Yeah. Wow. Uh, for those of you who are just tuning in, I'm with my sister, Sadhviji, and she has a powerful memoirs onto the bestseller list from Hollywood to the Himalayas. And it's a memoir of her transformation and ultimately moving from uh, California to actually living in India. And she's gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna talk about that a little bit. So if you're just tuning in, that's who I'm speaking with today. And so, so you traveled with your husband 
So you were married and then you went to, and you became a renunciate. <laughs> you went from being married all the way to going to India, having this, this moment of conscious connection with the divine presence where you felt there was no separation between you and the divine and that your identity was no longer merely the individual that had been traumatized as a, as a young person and gone through the trauma and the drama of that, but your identity was something else. Your identity was one with the presence of God. So how did you move from, okay, I'm married to now I'm going to be a renunciate. What, what, what happened in there? And, and how did that sh obviously shifted your relationship with your husband, but it must've shifted everything <laughs> in your life. It did. And you know, it was not, it was not automatic at all. The experience that I had was so all encompassing that any of the logistic details of my life, being married, having a PhD to finish, having an apartment that we were paying rent on, any of the logistics were just of no relevance at all. It didn't matter. I was, I was melting and merging into this infinite ocean. And it would be like someone saying, you know, what's for dinner? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and it was just, it, I was being fed on every level so deeply that the, the logistics of how this was going to manifest, what this was going to look like, were actually irrelevant to me at the moment. I just knew it all was going to work out. It all was going to be perfect. Everything was perfect. And of course, in the beginning, I had envisioned that my husband would be there with me. The experiences that I had were not experiences of, oh, now I need to be alone. There was so much love in my heart that it, it embraced all. It was all. I felt like there was nothing of me other than overflowing love. And so whether loving God, loving the mother goddess river, loving the trees, the children, or loving my husband, they all were just wrapped up, enveloped in this, in this love that just was overpouring. So I never had had a sense of this instead of that. There was no sense at that moment of renunciation or celibacy. It was a moment of ecstasy and allness. What happened over the next few months, sadly, was that that was not the way that my husband had wanted it to be. There were a variety of dynamics in the relationship that made, made him not open to that space and that made him feel like he needed to be on his own. And so he left to travel all over different parts of India. I still felt like, okay, well, after that, we'll definitely, you know, we'll still be together. However this thing ends up, ultimately we will be together. But that wasn't what the divine universal plan had been. And so through, through a series of different dramatic traumatic moments that were really tragically wrapped up with the the pain and the anger that he felt about what had happened right and his his need to go on his way and to explore with other women and other relationships he basically said to me that if I wasn't if I wasn't going to choose to be in relationship with him in exactly the way that he had clearly delineated, which no longer worked with the world that I had, had been blessed to inhabit. You were, a you, you were a different being. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah. And so it, it dissolved and by God's grace, we are, are friends today. He has a beautiful wife, he has beautiful children and has really, has really co-created a very, very, very beautiful life for himself. So it was all in, in service of that which needed to unfold. And for me after that, the celibacy was really 
really something that just came naturally. You know, I, I talk about how sometimes people think that there's all of this intense, intense spiritual work that one has to do to maintain that. And for me, it really happened by grace. It was like God came through with you know, one of those dust buster vacuum cleaners that gets into the little, <laughs> the little corners. And as soon as it was clear, I was meant to live this life. God just kind of vacuum cleanered out from me, all of that within me that was not conducive to living that life desires for everything ranging from, you know, avocados and bagels to sex and everything in between. Like, mm -hmm. here's all the things that are not going to be available in the package deal of a life that you've chosen. Right. Right. And so I'm going to just remove your desire for them. And that's, that's what happened. And it's not that it went away forever. There are stories in the book of when when desire came back and what that looked like once I had already taken vows of renunciation. But pretty much it's been actually a very ease filled mm. path. It doesn't, it doesn't feel to me like I have renounced things. It feels much more to me like I have been given so much. And yes, there's some things that this package deal of life doesn't include. But ultimately, I think that really all of what we're all doing in our lives is choosing the best package deal for ourselves. I think it's right. kind of a, a disservice to tell ourselves that we can actually have everything and have everything simultaneously, that the universe right. is, a, is a buffet and whatever you want to pile on your plate, there will be room for it. So right. You can't, you can choose what you want to fill your plate up with. The, the options are all there, but you can't actually fit every single item simultaneously on your plate. You have to choose. And for me, as far as package deals go, that which I've been given and blessed with has been so much more than that which doesn't fit on the plate. It's powerful. Now, did you always, as a young person, did you practice yoga and meditation or did that come about? Uh, I'm going to ask you two questions. Did that come about through your evolution in India? And I understand you did go back to get your PhD. You didn't just release that particular uh, dynamic in your life. Yeah. So I was already a yoga student. I studied Iyengar yoga in San Francisco. It was for me a practice that healed me on physical levels. I was in school in the days before iPads. And so we used to lug around really, really heavy book bags. And my yoga practice was that which treated my back and my shoulders and my neck. Also, that which treated my emotional state. I was studying with a teacher in San Francisco named Manuso Manos, who's a phenomenal, phenomenal teacher. And he could look at me from across the room and tell I was in trouble emotionally, mm -hmm. what I was suffering from, what I was going through, and would actually give me different postures and different sequences to shift my brain chemistry. And so I could walk into a class completely depressed, miserable, having been vomiting. And he would take one look at me and know it. And 90 minutes later, I would feel anchored and grounded and centered and whole. So that was what yoga was for me. It was not a path about God or a path about union, but it was much more a path about health. Mm -hmm. Medi meditation was something I had never done. Although in retrospect, I'm able to look, I've, I've always been a mountain person, a nature person. And I used to go to the Redwoods all the time, to Muir Woods, to Big Basin, down to Big Sur, depending on how much time I had, and spend lots and lots of time lying in the dirt, in the needles beneath the Redwoods. 
just watching the way the sun would reflect and refract through the branches of the redwoods and I would lose myself. Right. And in retrospect, I can say, oh yeah, I was meditating. Right. But that just was you, not you part were, of my... You were finding yourself. Exactly. You, you were losing the surface self and finding the deeper self. Exactly, yeah. exactly. I just wouldn't have, I didn't have that semantic framework at the time. So I would right. have said, no, I don't meditate. And But that was for me the place where I experienced the divine, where I experienced the truth of myself. And in coming to India, what I've learned about yoga is that yoga means union. Right. So it's not just the union that, you know, we had always thought of my fingertips to my toes or my head to my knees, but actually of that self to the divine through our sadhana, through our spiritual practice, through our meditation, as well as through as we're given in the Bhagavad Gita, paths of love, bhakti, paths of gyan, wisdom, paths of action, karma. And so when I came to India, yoga became every minute and every moment of my life rather than, you know, something I did for 90 minutes at a time. Right. The way of living. Absolutely. Absolutely. And with regard to the PhD, what happened was really God's grace because I didn't have any interest in finishing it. To me, I felt like every year, so many people get MDs, get PhDs, but there's no correlation between misery in the world, hunger in the world, despair in the world, and the number of people with MDs or PhDs. It's not like the more people who get advanced degrees, the better off our world is. And that I, <laughs> But, and it's sad because when most of us go into it, we go into it thinking through this degree, I'm going to make the world a better place. And yet that correlation just doesn't usually hold up tragically. And what I found was that I was offered this opportunity through the service to actually have a ripple impact of good in the world through all of the charitable programs, through all the humanitarian work, the schools and the women's programs and the environmental work. And so I said to Swamiji, I was like, don't make me just get another piece of paper on the wall. It's, it's irrelevant, who cares? And he was, he was really patient for a long time. And then what happened, because the universe always works out so beautifully, is that when I had first left California in 1996, I had said to my school, I said, you know, I'll finish this thing and email it in. And they laughed at me. Like in 1996, the email was, it was a toy. It was, a, right. you know, we had AOL mail and, you know, you've got mail. And, and it, was, it was a toy. It was a joke. It was a fun way of communicating. It was not a legitimate means right, of conducting right. business. But... In the seven, eight years after that, suddenly the internet became a very, very viable means of conducting business, conducting academics. And so fast forward from 96 up to about 2005 or so, and I realized that actually now the possibility did exist for me to do, because I had finished my coursework. It was just a matter of writing and dissertation and research. I realized that I actually could submit most of it in via, via email. And so I ended up being able to do most of it actually from, from India. And of course, completely changed the theme of what I was doing it on. Into... Another good, another good, another good use of technology. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly, exactly. Well, you, let me ask you this. You know, one of the things in your book, uh, you talk about, and I really, I really like um, this subject. Uh, you really talk about the art of forgiveness, mm. and, you, and you talk about the art of forgiveness with your father, 
and the abuse. I mean, what would you say to people now that are struggling with uh, the, the f forgiveness, forgiving of someone else, forgiving of some wrongdoing in their life? I mean, you, you worked through that and were able to embrace another level of your being that was not harmed or, or hurt uh, by abuse. And what would you say to, to individuals today that are going, that need, that need to embrace forgiveness on some level? Mm. Reverend Michael, this is such, such a critical topic because so many people are moving through the world today full of anger, full of grudges, full of resentment. And what these become is they become the jails that we actually voluntarily lock ourselves up in. It's like right. some, someone else did something to us. And we then walk into a jail, lock ourselves up, and throw away the key. For me, what, I, what I've learned is we forgive, not because what the other person did is okay. And this is essential because there are things that people do that are not okay. Right. And forgiving does not mean, oh, I, I hereby... Con condone you and I absolve you of your karmic debt. I absolve you of any ramifications, any karmic fruits that you will experience. That isn't forgiveness. We don't have that power. I always say until and unless God comes down and taps you on the shoulder and says, hey, do me a favor. Could you, could you keep some notes for me? You know, my secretary is on holiday. Could you take some notes for me and remind me who's do what right until that happens just assume you are not god's secretary you don't need to be noting down who's done what who deserves what who has sinned where realize through the law of karma people are gonna are gonna have seeds that they've planted sprout into trees in their own lives. And there is nothing for us to do either to make that sprout faster or to uproot it. Our forgiveness or our holding on does not change the nature of the tree that's going to grow in their life. But our holding on keeps us stuck. Yes. Our holding on says, I am going to sacrifice. I'm going to offer up my life, my joy, my peace, my freedom on the altar of your ignorance, your anger, yes. your ego, your fear. And the question becomes, why in the world would we want to do that? Yes. Someone, someone is angry. They were confused. They were working with a very empty toolkit in the world. Why would we then voluntarily offer up the gift of our life on the altar of their empty toolkit? Right. Of their ignorance. Of their ignorance, of their ego, of their anger, of their fear, of their confusion. But that's what we do when we hold a grudge. We are saying, okay, you harmed me. That's right. And I'm going to keep harming myself. Right. You did it that, once. That's, that's exactly true. <laughs> Holding a grudge is heavy lifting in this world. And I often say that uh, to not forgive is actually uh, a degree of self-abuse. We're actually we're abusing ourself when we're holding on to resentment, animosity, unforgiveness, because all of that energy is not hurting the other person. All of that energy is hurting us. Our, our internal chemical makeup changes, toxic chemicals flow. We, we impair our immune system. The coherence of our brain uh, becomes askew. We, we age faster. We become a condition for disease. So everything that you're saying is so in league with the fact that unforgiveness is self-abuse. And we don't Absolutely. want to abuse ourselves. We, we want to love this life and let it shine, let it glow. And I love what you said. We don't want someone else's ignorance, someone else's lack of maturity someone else uh, egregious behavior to keep us from living the life 
uh, that's loaded and coated with a great destiny if we just let it be free. Yes. Yes, to forgiveness. Exactly. And you, you went, I mean, you're not, what I love about this, you're not speaking in your memoir of being on an ivory tower and giving an academic discourse on forgiveness. <laughs> you lived it. You had drama and trauma and abuse in your life. And you actually had to go through the process of letting go to step into the iteration that we're speaking to today. You know, this, this, this okay. being that's full of service and kindness and compassion and love. And you are loved and adored by so many people around the world uh, because of the vibration that you carry. You know, so oftentimes people can go give a good lecture on forgiveness. Uh, but you're not giving good lectures. You actually, you've actually lived this. And I just want to say thank yeah. you. you know. Well, thank, thank you. It has been the most healing and powerful thing that I've ever, that I've ever done. And it's that which has enabled me to be free because not only does it take away that heavy lifting, not only are you free of the physical weight of the grudge on your heart, but you actually become free of the identity as well. That's which for the point me right there. I love this the point. That, that, that identity is not really you. Exactly, exactly. And so when we move through the world as the one who was, abused, abandoned, betrayed, cheated, harmed, always gets the short end of the stick, whatever our individual personal stories may be, that identity becomes how we see the world, how we move through the world, and therefore what we manifest for ourselves in the world. That's and it. There's no, no skirt over that point right there. I think this is, <laughs> this is very important that when you, when you are in that limited perception, then and you say that's how you, you manifest from that, that, those, that perception and those thought forms color your reality and create experience. And it's not like blame, it's, it's just your, that's just law. Yes. And so when the identity changes, your brain waves change, your perception change, thought forms change, and your life really changes. It's not magical thinking. It's a real shift in perception. Yeah, this is, this is powerful. Yeah, and it's, and it's been so powerful. I mean, for me, that was, that was 25 years ago. Literally, just last week was 25 years from when I, I, understand. When I, I understand. moved to India. And it just feels like such an extraordinary blessing to not have that identity and not move through the world. I think about it sometimes, you know, when we were kids and we were learning how to write the alphabet and we got stencils, those yeah. big plastic things and you would color on them. Like if you had the A, you'd have an A stencil and you'd color. And regardless of what you did with your crayon, what ended up coming onto the paper was an A because the stencil was A. And so no matter how you colored, what color you used, what you used to draw, you always would get an A. Yes. And that's how so many of us move through our world is we've got these stencil-like filters based on who we think we are. Oh, I'm an A. So as we move through the world, that stencil is there. Whatever happens, we're moving through it, but we're only able to create that which is who we already think we are. And for me to be able to let go of that was so extraordinary and to really forgive. And, you know, for most of us, if you look at that which happened to us in childhood, you look back at your parents and you think, okay, so how old were they when you were born? And in most cases, our parents were in our, the young 20s, mid 20s, in some cases, even the late teens. Now, you look at people in their early to mid 20s now. And even early 30s. Or even early 30s. And they're babies. They're babies. And they're, they're beautiful babies in many senses. But they're children having children. They are mired in the midst of their own fear and confusion and worry and anger and illusions and delusions. And so naturally, that's how they're going to move through the world. That's how they're going to pass it on to you. Not because they woke up one day and said, I know what I'm going to do. 
I'm going to really mess up her life or his life. <laughs> they're just, <laughs> they were they're doing, doing their the best, best they can. Exactly. They're doing their best. They didn't know what they were doing. They were doing exactly. the very best they could. And it was on the job training. Exactly. Exactly. And so when we can see them like that, it really takes a lot of that sting out. And for me, being able to forgive was just so, so powerful because suddenly it took away that whole identity, that whole sense of thinking that I was, that I was someone who I, someone who I was, who I was not. Right. And being able to be free to really be the truth of, of who I am and to not carry anger and pain and grudges and this false identity and therefore the addiction that stemmed from it. But the last point I wanted to, to mention on that is that when you're talking to people about forgiving and letting go, there is an element of what am I stepping into? If I am not the one who was abused, betrayed, cheated, lied to, got the short end of the stick, the least favored of the batch, whatever the drama may be, then who am I? Mm -hmm. If I'm not, mm -hmm. therefore, the alcoholic, the drug addict, the bulimic, the addict, who am I? Right. And to really let go of the pain, of the grudge, of the addiction requires what I think about as a trust fall into the universe. That, you know, we go on these retreats with our, our school or with our corporate world, and we do these falling back trust falls right. into the arms of people, in many cases, strangers. In some cases, they are enemies even or competitors. But we always drop back because we know they're not going to let me fall, even right. if it's a stranger. And that trust that we have for a stranger, that trust that we have for an enemy, if we can trust fall into the universe knowing you are the one who turns caterpillars into butterflies, seeds into trees that give fruit, that makes, that makes trees know that when growing straight up isn't going to work, there's not enough light, teaches them to grow sideways. Yeah. In order to get their light. Yeah. That, that intelligence in the universe, yes. if we can trust fall into that, that knowing that we're going to be caught, it enables us to really let go. Because otherwise that fear is, well, then who will I be? And so one of my favorite practices is the trust fall into the universe knowing I'm going to be caught. And actually there isn't even, there isn't even anywhere to fall. It's not even a fall. I'm being already held. Yes. You're letting go to what is. Exactly, exactly. As, as we bring this beautiful interview to a close, um, first of all, I see people writing, asking me, is this interview going to stay on my, my platform because they want to listen to it again and again? The answer is yes. It will be on my Instagram page so you can come back and you can hear this, this love and compassion and wisdom flowing from Sadhviji. So that's uh, number one. To Sabi, um, your book, uh, where can they get it? And ah. what final words would you like to say? Uh, you know, when you think about the book, what do you want to convey from the book to these people that are listening to you and where can they get it? Beautiful. So the book is called Hollywood to the Himalayas, as you've said so beautifully. This is this is what it looks like. And they did just such a beautiful, beautiful job. I love, I love sharing that, that image of the, the sunrise over the waters of Mother Gunga with the sari 
flowing over it. So they can get it on Amazon right away. It's available right now. They can get it. Amazon will probably have it in their mailboxes today, tomorrow. If they've got a local bookstore, likely the bookstore will have it. If not, walk into your local bookstore and ask them to order it. And in terms of messages, in terms of takeaway from it, I think for me, the core takeaway is there's two arcs. Arc one is my journey of Hollywood to the Himalayas, which is the very physical journey that I took, this spiritual adventure, this fascinating, exciting adventure of, you know, the 25-year-old white Jewish married Stanford grad who ends up in India with a backpack and 25 years later is a celibate monastic as a spiritual teacher as a as a vehicle as a vessel as an instrument for for the divine so there's that that and and arc. and the, the work that you do is tremendous i mean i've been there and the the, the feeding the water the, the the sanitation i mean it's real world transformation being expressed from a connection with the presence of God. Mm -hmm. And you, you, you and um, Guruji do such powerful work. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm just, I just wanna just say that, that, that the work that you do touches thousands and thousands of people in India. And I'm, I'm grateful, I'm grateful mm -hmm. to know you and I'm grateful to be a part of it. Thank you. And it's such a blessing to do that work. And so that, that arc, and in fact, it's not even me doing it, rather, it's just having it flow, flow through us. And that always is the prayer, like St. Francis of Assisi said so beautifully of, oh, Lord, make me an instrument of thy peace. So for me, that's my prayer is just how can I be that instrument? So there's the arc, that very physical, dramatic arc of the plot from Hollywood to the Himalayas via Stanford University. That story, that excitement. And then there's a second arc. And the second arc is the thought process of what I call the Hollywood way of thinking, which is you are your body, you are your race, you are your religion, you are your size, your shape, your story, your history, your drama, what's happened to you, what you've done, how much is in your bank account, what are your roles, what are your relationships, what are your titles, that whole package drama is what Hollywood tells us is who we are. And by the way, whether you live in Hollywood or not is irrelevant because that has touched all over you're talking the, about a mindset. The world, exactly. A mindset, a culture, yeah. a way of thinking. So that's our Hollywood way of thinking. And then there's the Himalayan way of thinking, which says you have a body. It has a shape. It has a size. It moves through the world in a certain way. It plays a certain role. But you're not your body. You are soul, spirit, consciousness, love, yes. divinity, infinity. Yes. And, and for you to identify as the body is untruth. The example I always give is if I were driving down the road and you called me and you said, who are you? And I said, oh, I'm exit 30. And you said, no, 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 I didn't say, where are you? I said, who are you? And then again, I say, oh, now I'm exit 31. <laughs> you would think either her phone is out of range, the signal's really bad, or you would think that I had kind of lost my marbles because we know that we are not where our car has reached. Right. But for me to say to you. And you're not even the car. <laughs> of course. 
<laughs> for me to say to you, I am a white American female, 50 year old renunciant sannyasi is like saying I'm exit 30. Right. As though somehow where my vehicle has reached at this intersection of time and space is who I am. So that shift is a shift that everyone can have regardless of where you live, regardless of whether you can get on a plane and come to India or not. That shift of thought, that shift of mindset, from being the body, being the story, being the chemical and electrical patterns of behavior in the brain that we call emotions and personalities and habits and thoughts, to being Absolutely. soul, infinite spirit and love and consciousness, that's something everyone can do. Yes. And that is the, the healing and the transformation. God bless you, Sadvi. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And From Hollywood to the Himalayas, that's her memoir. You can get it on Amazon, and I'm pretty sure you can get it at Agape as well, uh, agapelive.com on, on our bookstore. If we don't have it, we'll have it shortly. And I just want to thank you for giving us your time hmm. for this uh, conversation, for us to reconnect again. I want to thank everybody for tuning in today. And as I said earlier, this will be permanently on my platform, Instagram platform. So you'll be able to see it. It'll be on other platforms that I have as well. And uh, hopefully we'll see you all on Sunday at uh, one of our three services. The Way of Meditation service is at 6.45 a.m. Pacific time. And then two other services are at 9 and 11.30 with a meditation service at 8.30 a.m. and a meditation service at 11 a.m all in keeping with the way of life that Savi was describing, uh, not just a, a one hit thing that you do, but developing a way of life based on uh, love and, and surrender and meditation and prayer and sacred service and uh, embracing the next iteration of what you are becoming. And so Savi is a prime example as a teacher and an exemplar of a powerful way of living. And, uh, I love her. And, uh, so I, I love you, you so much. I love you so, so, so much, so deeply, so dearly. And I just cannot wait to see you and hug you and dance together again on Absolutely. the banks of Mother Ganga. Soon and very soon. So much love. So much God love to you. you. Thank you. Mm, thank, thank you. you. And thank everyone for tuning in. Uh, appreciate your presence. Again, we'll see you uh, Sunday, agapelive.com. Have a bright day.